Hello, BookTube. Matthew over at Mayberry Book Club and I have been turning the title of his BookTube channel into a reality by making a little book club of two, uh, or sometimes three, if someone horns in on the action. <laughs> and we have been picking a, a different thing to read each month and reading it together. And it's been a lot of fun. And uh, the month of September, we're finishing up with a read-along of uh, the great graphic novel Kingdom Come written by Mark Wade, uh, with art by the great Alex Ross. Uh, continuing a little informal tradition on the Mayberry Book Club of reading graphic novels, taking them seriously, and reading them got off to a rocky start with Batman Dark Knight Returns, but there have been good signs, there have been good parts as well, and this is great. I'm so happy uh, that Matthew is enjoying this, coming to it... At <laughs> Hi, baby. Hi, what you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm so glad that Matthew is enjoying this. Occasionally I worry about uh, recommending Kingdom Come to newcomers to Four Color Superhero Comics because it is so much of a love letter to the past, to continuity, to the legends that are the, that is the DC stable of heroes, Superman. Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Green Lantern, uh, by adoption, Captain Marvel, who was originally not a DC character, but DC eventually adapted, adopted him. Uh, those are my favorite superheroes, far more so than, uh, than the feet of clay superheroes of Marvel Comics. And I worry when I recommend Kingdom Come because there's a great deal, there's a huge cast of characters, thousands of superheroes, super beings of one kind or another. And I think it's saved from uh, insider baseball confusion by the fact that so many of the principal characters, and this is a wisdom of Mark Wade, the writer, so many of the principal characters are those iconic marquee characters, beings that uh, no, no one is is going to be completely ignorant about, even if they've never read a comic book, you're going to know the name Lex Luthor. You're going to know Batman. You're going to know Wonder Woman. You're going to know Superman. Uh, this is not... Kingdom Come is not an extreme case of that. An extreme case of that, I think the most extreme case of all, would be Avengers Forever uh, by Kurt Busiek, which I don't think Matthew and I will ever do, if only, if only because... Uh, Avengers Forever is actually a detailed love letter to people who have never missed an issue of Marvel Comics. <laughs> not the one, not just Avengers, but any Marvel comic. People who have never missed an issue and have been drawing little dots on the line on their whiteboard ever since to connect all the dots. I love Avengers Forever. I think it's fantastic, but I don't think that... I, no offense to Matthew, but I don't think he'd make a single head or tail out of it. But Kingdom Come is different. We have been following an epic story. Ten years have passed since the DC heroes were in their heyday and were fighting villains and righting wrongs. Uh, the heroes have retired, and the villains have largely gone underground as well, leaving the, the space open for a new nihilistic generation of super beings that are really neither hero nor villain. Uh, sometimes. They, they are mainly just uninhibited and destructive. And a preacher named Norm McKay is uh, approached by a semi-divine being who used to be a superhero called the Spectre. The Spectre allows Norm McKay to go with him and travel intangibly, see all the events as they're unfolding, learn all about what's going on in the past and also in the present. When circumstances with these nihilistic super beings become so dire that Superman decides to come out of his self-imposed retirement. He's older, he's grayer, uh, he's far more powerful, and he, his reappearance inspires other heroes to come back as well. And they begin to try to reimpose order on the nihilistic super beings all around them. Quite a few of those super beings fall in line. Think, uh, as one character says, I feel like I've just been asked to become the 13th apostle. They, it's, it's just the kind of moral clarity and order that they have wanted without knowing it, so they fall in line. A lot of others don't, though. A lot of others are are intent on wreaking mayhem and and to hell with the earlier generation of heroes. And that earlier generation of heroes constructs a gigantic gulag in the irradiated Midwest of America and imprisons those those superpowered beings. Not forever, 
But as Superman tells them, we are, we're imprisoning you until you change your mind. It's all very fascistic. I think Mark Wade intentionally writes it that way. Uh, that gulag, of course, is a hotbed of discontent. <laughs> uh, and the, the super villains in the world, people like Lex Luthor or uh, Vandal Savage or Catwoman or the Riddler or whatnot, are intent on exploiting the tension in that gulag to their own ends. What those ends would be, I don't really know. I don't see how the original generation of supervillains, most of whom are portrayed in this as being the supervillains from DC continuity, who have very little in the way of superpowers themselves, mainly just schemers, like Lex Luthor or Dr. Savannah, uh, it seems to me that they, that they would benefit by having clear-cut lines between superpowered good guys and bad guys. It seems to me they'd be the first ones to suffer if the the next generation was just allowed to run wild and destroy things, including business opportunities. But uh, those supervillains uh, number amongst their ranks Captain Marvel, who has been badly brain damaged by Lex Luthor over those 10 years, and who, once he appears on the scene, he is Superman's physical equal, and uh, is a chaos agent. He Once he appears and flies to the Gulag to help with the uprising, or at least to stop Superman from, present, pre from preventing it, the situation can easily go completely out of control. As we're told in uh, this fourth volume, the fourth and concluding volume tells us this is not a fight that just ends, it's a fight that escalates until everyone suffers. Uh, Norman McKay and the Spectre get to go to the battlefield here and witness it. There is some incredible Alex Ross artwork. Notice... Uh, that Mark Wade does not have the gall to plop word balloons over a panel like that, and good for him. And the thing you're not really, you might not notice, there is the, that was actually a two-page spread in, uh, in the original comic. There's Superman duking it out with Captain Marvel. And the thing you might not notice is that, uh, thanks to Alex Ross's genius, these battle scenes that we're seeing in the background, there's the Spectre's hood, there's uh, Norman McKay, they're watching. And those battle scenes that we see in the background uh, are perfectly mirrored. This panel is this panel from a completely different angle at the exact same moment. Characters are exactly the same, just positioned completely differently. Unbelievable. Just it's unbelievable how much it rewards a reviewing in detail. And uh, one of the amazing things about uh, digital comics is the ability to pinch right in on a scene, to look at all of the details that are there. That is tremendous, <laughs> absolutely tremendous. I wouldn't have thought, uh, I would have, I would once upon a time have said, well, digital schmidgital, you know, the, the beautiful comic that you hold in your hand surely can't be improved upon. And maybe that might be true of some things, but a uh, uh, comic book artwork as detailed as this, uh, the, the ability to scale in really, really helps. Uh, and while this fight is going on at the Gulag, word, of course, has spread to the human world. And it's not just the, the ordinary human supervillains back in New York who are dismayed. It's the United Nations and the American Armed Command who come to a catastrophic decision. Just catastrophic. The man who makes the decision it, it is wrecked by it. And that decision is... Well, we've got all these super beings all together in one place. Quite a few of them cause lots and lots and lots of problems. And even the ones who are good often cause huge amounts of property damage. And they're all right there in this one location, one-fifth of a mile, together, all fighting each other. What if we were to nuke them? What if we were to nuke them? And there's, there's howls of protest in the UN saying, well, what about the massive loss of human life? What, the, the Midwest was irradiated already. This is even worse. But it's the chance to get rid of this problem once and for all. And mankind actually makes that decision. Now, this is the whole while this is happening, this battle is raging. And the details, once again, Alex Ross just does an amazing job here. The details in the background are congruent with each other from panel to panel, just in terms of, just rotated by angles. And uh, Batman has has been on the sidelines, at first looking like he was allying with Lex Luthor, but then 
assembling a superpowered force of his own. At the last minute, in the middle of this battle, they enter the fray uh, to try to help, to try to, to uh, restore order in the Gulag. But in the middle of the fighting, Wonder Woman and Batman, who've had a long-standing argument, end up fighting back-to-back uh, and then end up fighting each other. Uh, because Wonder Woman and Batman have always been uh, more aristocratic tempers among the Justice League. Uh, there was a moment in Justice League continuity where they actually ex- experiment with being lovers. But most of the time, they are, uh, at least once the Justice League started imitating Marvel comics and giving all of their different characters individual personalities, <laughs> which I don't say I wholly approve of. But once they started to have individual personalities, Batman's authoritarian tendencies rub uh, rough up against Wonder Woman's authoritarian tendencies. He's a, 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 you know, a billionaire loner who lives on his own and calls his own shots, and she's royalty. Uh, they argue. Uh, the, bi- the battle is still going on, but they, they argue. Uh, Wonder Woman says to him, after all these years, you have the nerve to swagger out of your cave and expect everyone to bow to your precious wisdom. Well, it's too late for that, Bruce. We tried to hold order, and it's gone too far. Our only option now is war. And they, she says this as she is vaulting him above the cloud level that is obscuring the battle at the Gulag. And once they get above that cloud level, they see the nuclear payloads on the way. And they're horrified. They spring into action immediately. Now, while, the, while this is happening, while they are noticing this, that, that mankind has taken the ultimate step, imagine, it, it, try imagining this in the 1950s or 60s, that the, the United States decides to nuke Superman. <laughs> but while they're doing that, underneath the cloud of battle, Superman is fighting with Captain Marvel, and he's trying to reason with him, saying, Marvel, in the name of heaven, wipe that empty smile off your face. You were a friend once. How can you do this? How? Look at the horror you've let loose. Say something for yourself. And Captain Marvel does. He says, Shazam, and then uses super speed to get out of the way. The lightning bolt strikes Superman. Superman might be incredibly powerful, but he is vulnerable to magic. And... Uh, Captain Marvel keeps doing it. He keeps saying Shazam and pelting Superman with one lightning bolt after another. Uh, it it looks like it's going poorly, especially since uh, Batman can take out one of these atomic jets and Wonder Woman takes out the other, but that leaves a third. A third bomb that falls. Now, I understand Mark Wade has a story to tell here. And I am long since accustomed to to writers underestimating the character of Wonder Woman. I'm long since accustomed to that. I sigh about it. I wish that it weren't true. It's, I understand Mark Wade is not going to be the author to overturn that, but according to the rubrics of how these characters were made, Wonder Woman is at least as powerful as Captain Marvel. Why we're bringing this whole thing down to the fact that two, the two most powerful male superheroes have to decide how things go. That only Superman is capable of tipping the balance at the Gulag. The Gulag is full of fourth raiders. Why wouldn't Wonder Woman going there alone be enough to top to tip the balance? I have no idea. And Wonder Woman can fly. Okay, and I know she has the, the bullet deflecting bracelets, but she's invulnerable. Uh, as she says, and there was one line, I forget who wrote it, there was one line in I think one of her comics about ten years ago where uh, a character says to her, you're pretty much invulnerable, right? And she says, yes. And he says, well, then why do you use bracelets to deflect bullets? And she says, do you think I like getting shot? <laughs> I love that. Absolutely. But basically, Wonder Woman is, she can fly at super speed. She's invulnerable. And she's as strong as Superman, at least. There is absolutely no reason in DC continuity why she can only take out one of these planes and not all three of them in one second. But... I understand. Mark Wade has a story to tell, and that means that one bomb is still falling on this fight. While Superman is desperately trying to fight, and look at, see the job that Alex Ross does? His Captain Marvel never loses that, that, uh, Frederick Murray smile, that goody two-shoes faucet hero smile, even while his lightning bolts are knocking the crap out of Superman. Finally, he says Shazam again, and Superman uses super speed of his own to get there in order to stop Billy Batson, in order to stop him from saying the word again and keep him as a mortal person. 
Superman could, could pop his head like a pimple, but he doesn't. Instead, Superman hears the bomb. He knows that third bomb is coming. Uh, and the fight is still raging on, and Superman tells Billy Batson, uh, you're the one who's got to decide what to do. You've got to come to your senses. You've got to decide what is going to happen here. Billy Batson is crying. See, Superman has got through to him. Superman takes off. He's going to try and stop that last bomb. And when he flies away, Billy Batson says Shazam one more time. Becomes Captain Marvel. Overtakes Superman, not to stop him, but to do the job instead. And sacrifices himself. And uh, the bomb explodes. And it explodes at ground zero. And for a moment, Superman believes that he's the only one who survived. It, there's mists and cloud everywhere. He thinks for the minute that he's the sole survivor, which when I read this the first time, immediately raised questions of mine. The usual kinds of questions that I have, the continuity cop questions that I have, which is pretty simple. Uh, how many DC superheroes could survive a ground zero detonation of a nuclear bomb? How many of them could do that? Superman could, despite what we saw in Dark Knight Returns, that he, he could easily do it. Superman is invulnerable. <laughs> Captain Marvel can do it too. We're assuming that he dies here because when he says Shazam, he becomes Billy Batson and dies in the explosion. Uh, I would like to think Wonder Woman, certainly. Dr. Fate, the Spectre, once upon a time. Spectre is, is a different kind of character in, in this book. Uh, pretty much all the Kryptonians, one way or another, Power Girl or Superboy or uh, that sort of thing, Green Lantern, his ring could certainly, his ring can take him through the coronasphere of the sun, so it would certainly be able to protect him. Maybe a handful of others, but most DC superheroes, I imagine, would die. Would would uh, Flash might be able to vibrate his way out of, of difficulty. Certainly most DC supervillains would die. I can only think of a handful wouldn't. Uh, but anyway, Superman thinks he's alone uh, in this charred wilderness. Look at that. I mean, there are lots of fatalities. Look at that. Rib cages, frozen, blasted, uh, melted people. Classic Alex Ross. Just classic. There's Superman in the middle of just a, a... He rises from the ashes and takes off. He is headed for the UN. And he means to destroy them. He means to punish humans for making that decision. He has lost his temper, which is the underground drama of the character of Superman in comics just in general. He's raised by a wonderful Midwestern couple in America, and he comes to maturity as a rock-solid Midwestern man, someone who never loses his sense of right and wrong, someone who is always willing with an open, giving hand, and someone who is very, very slow to anger. I know in 21st century, in uh, 2021 especially, news footage at night might have you believe that American Midwesterners are not like that, but most of them are. And he's one of them. Well, there's one point in a comic about 10 years ago where one of the characters, I think it might have been Batman, says uh, the, the, the number one fear here is not the fear of supervillains that Superman will be the one to face them, because he's basically unbeatable. The number one fear among us all, among superheroes, is that Superman will lose his temper. <laughs> and, and that's what happens here. And Norman McKay demands that the Spectre, he angrily demands that the Spectre take him there to the UN, where Superman is indeed intending to kill everyone present. And Norman McKay talks to him and says that he has to forgive himself, that he has to remember his humanity. Uh, and it works. It works. It calms Superman down, and right at that same moment, he learns that there are survivors. See, that there's Batman, uh, there's Wonder Woman, there's Green Lantern coming in with his daughter. Uh, he learns that there are survivors. As Batman says, uh, enough to leave us with the same problem as before, the same impasse, the same dangers, the same distrust, the same everything. Because a number of supervillains have survived as well. Uh, Superman assures the humans involved that they will honor Captain Marvel's memory uh, by standing among humans and helping them to solve their own problems instead of reigning over them as super beings. Uh, Batman reconciles with Dick Grayson. Wonder Woman is reinstated into the royal succession on Paradise Island. Uh, 
And Superman is himself again. He goes to the irradiated fields of Kansas, but to help it grow. Wonder Woman gives him uh, a gift to help him see better, a pair of glasses. She hands him the glasses to him, calling him Cal, Cal-El, which is what he insists that she call him at the beginning of this miniseries. But she leaves by saying, uh, take care, Clark. Uh, because he has regained his humanity. He has found, again, his way to live with humans. Uh, and there he is pulling a giant plow to help. Uh, and there is a dog down on the ground there. Uh, and that is the end of the story. Norman McKay goes back to preaching in, in, the, in his church. And the specter's job is done. Crisis has been averted. Uh, but Mark Wade gives us a great epilogue that takes place one year later. When our heroes, the, the trinity of DC Comics, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman, can get together. They get together at a, at a, a superhero-themed restaurant. Uh, and at first it seems a little conspicuous, but uh, Batman says, uh, the, amidst all this bric-a-brac, this toddy bric-a-brac, I doubt they'd take notice of us if we were fighting the Legion of Doom in full costume. <laughs> uh, he shows up. He shows up at their table. Because they've got an announcement for him. They want to catch up. They want to talk to each other about how things are going. Superman talks about how uh, he's he's working to make the win the Midwest livable again. Batman talks about the rehabilitation program for the supervillains that, that survived the nuclear explosion. But the real surprise is Wonder Woman. And she thinks she's going to catch Batman by surprise, but she doesn't. He inf instead informs her that she's pregnant. Uh, there's, that's a great moment. They're stunned because he knows. <laughs> uh, and Wonder Woman gets her revenge because Bruce Wayne has, has stunned them by, by spoiling their surprise, but she has another surprise for him. She, they want him to be the child's godfather. They want him to help raise the child. The, uh, even though this child is almost certainly going to be unbelievably powerful. They want, uh, Batman's perspective, uh, he says, my, my record as a parent isn't spotless. And Diana says, Bruce, I'll be the first to admit I know little about fatherhood, but I do know this. There are things the Batman can teach our child that Clark and I can't, that we'd never even think of. That's wonderful. And Mark Wade is about to do one better. <laughs> he, uh, he gives the last word in this encounter to Superman who is talking to Batman, to Bruce Wayne. And keep in mind, they've been fiercely arguing throughout these four issues. He says, well, let's talk about what we're, almost all, what we're all most afraid of. Look at the lesson we just learned right now. The scales of world power are balanced, but still too easy to tip. Our child, more than any other, will need the leavening influence of a mortal man, a moral man, who we can count on. You're right about me. Trust is the center of my world. I don't know if that makes me an expert on it, but I know I trust you. Despite all our differences over the years, I always have. Just wonderful. Just wonderful. Uh, and they leave the restaurant, and that is the end of the story. Uh, they, they, they say, let's go home and dream about the future. Now, uh, that is the end of what is, in, in DC Comics, almost certainly, along with Dark Knight Returns, one of the greatest, most popular what if Elseworld possible future stories? Uh, the the one problem that I have with this is not a fault of Kingdom Come. It's a fault of lazy writers who come later. This always happens, whether it's Days of Future Past in the X-Men or Dark Knight Returns or Kingdom Come. What happens is that these little miniseries become so popular with fans. Kingdom Come is reprinted twice a year and always will be. Uh, they become so popular with fans that the more workaday hack authors who write the actual monthly and weekly comics decide, well, why not build towards these stories as if they were canonical? Why not introduce the character of Gog? Why not introduce uh, mutant registration or whatnot? Why not edge things towards this future? Uh, this, these are just supposed to be one possible future. There's no saying that these things are going to happen. But that, but that's the fault of other writers, not the fault of these. That That is... Uh, that is our read-along for this month, Kingdom Come. I'm hoping that those of you who read along with us really enjoyed it. Uh, I loved going through it again. I've loved watching uh, Matthew's videos and even Noah's uh, about uh, how this thing hits. 
after all this time, after all these years, it still works perfectly. Uh, so we'll, we'll, this might be the last graphic novel for 2022, but we will certainly, I would assume, or 2021, but I would certainly assume that if the Mayberry Book Club continues, we will continue doing graphic novels. I know exactly what I want the next one to be. Uh, but in the meantime, we will now be moving on to our October read-along, which you've already seen, an announcement video by me, and that is Dune, Frank Herbert's Dune. We will be doing a read-along. Now, I've already done a read-along of Dune, at least a couple, one time, maybe a couple of times on my own channel, but it's deep and multifaceted work. It will certainly sustain another read-along. <laughs> and we're going to be doing that in the month of June, so get your Dune copy. <laughs> we, will be, we will be digging in to lay the groundwork so that you're all ready for the Timothy Chalamet face fest of a movie. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. That ends Kingdom Come. What a wonderful reading experience it was. Uh, and I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.